I'm Dave Kassler, KE0OG, and I welcome you to the third episode of Ask Dave, a series devoted to answering your questions about ham radio, especially for those new to the hobby. I appreciate your comments and questions from the last episode and ask that you continue to comment either on YouTube or on my website at ke0og.net or by submitting a question via ke0og.net slash ask hyphen Dave. Today's episode is motivated by questions from Reese and Jacob and to both of you, thank you. Today's discussion will be especially interesting for those of you who want to set up a station in your home. This is equally applicable for the new tech or the new general. We'll use this drawing that shows a bare minimum station as our reference design. This would be for a VHF rig used as a home rig or an HF rig at home. The components are the same. We have at the center the transceiver, which I show with the handheld mic that comes with the radio. Almost all rigs these days require so-called 12-volt power supplies, actually 13.8 volts DC. And there's an external antenna and associated cabling. You could add lots more things. But if you take away any of the things shown in the diagram, you won't have a functioning station. Obviously, the simplest station is the handheld radio. These have become downright inexpensive and are a great first radio used primarily for local communication with hams you already know. If you have one, you know that as it stands with this dinky antenna, it has very short range, sometimes not even a mile or two. You can put it in your car with an external antenna and that gives extended range. But eventually, we all want a station at home, whether for VHF or for HF. Let's talk about where in your home to put your station. First, Let's look at mine, which I keep in a spare bedroom. Needless to say, your station will be set up differently from mine, but it's sometimes nice to have something to compare to. My station currently has four radios. The big one here, the Tentec Jupiter, is my HF rig. This ICOM IC2100 does its work on 2 meter digital. This Yesu FT7800 is for voice on 2 meters and 70 centimeters. And this little Oak Hills OHR100A is a 20 meter CW only QRP rig. Let's look at some additional features. First, I have plenty of desk space in front of my radios for my notebook and logbook. Second, I have ample light. Third, I have space to put notebooks and manuals where I can get at them easily. And the station is located right next to my computer. That way, when I run digital modes, I can get at both the computer and the radio. Note also that all the cables are run out of the way where no one will trip over them. Since I own the home, I don't have to ask anyone's permission to put a hole in the floor to get cables down to the crawl space and then out into the open. I keep these holes plugged up to keep the cold air from coming in during the winter. For me, my station is pretty ideal. It's the result of years of tinkering and adding and changing equipment and wiring. Our children are grown and gone, so I don't have to worry about baby-proofing all of this, but it is something you may need to think about if you have little ones around. Are there other places in the home you can put a station? Certainly. Let's look around. The bathroom? Maybe not. Electricity and water don't mix well. A bedroom? If you're not sharing with anyone, you could put a little desk in somewhere. But chasing hot DX at 3 in the morning might be unpopular with your spouse. How about a closet? Well, if you can clear a space where you can put in a small desk or table, this can work. 
Be sure you have adequate ventilation. Such a location can help alleviate stress between you and a life partner who does not think that radios are decorative. You really don't need much room. How about in the living room or in the dining room? Again, it becomes a negotiation between you and your spouse. I do point out that your relationship with your life partner is more important than ham radio, so looking for a solution that works for everyone is a good idea. How about in a garage? Will it get too cold or too hot? Is this a place you'd really like to spend lots of time? How about in the basement? This is certainly possible, although our basement gets rather cold in the winter. Let's look again at the bare minimum reference design. Some will vigorously argue that more is necessary, but this basic setup served me for many years. In future videos, we'll add things, but for now, let's just examine the essentials. Of course, you may go about everything differently, but we can begin our discussion here. We'll start on the left-hand side with the power supply. Nearly all rigs these days, whether VHF mobiles or HF rigs, require a separate power supply that provides 13.8 volts DC. A typical 100-watt HF rig wants a stable input voltage at loads ranging from a couple watts up to more than 100, with the amperage requirement changing with each syllable you speak. Fortunately, such power supplies are readily available. We often refer to them as 12-volt supplies, when in actuality they are around 13.8 volts DC. This popular power supply, the PowerWorks SS30DV, is an example. This power supply is made with ham radio in mind. It's a switching power supply and is small. There's not much to it, just a power inlet and a couple places to get your DC power out. Its only control is an on-off switch. I note that this power supply has a built-in fan that varies in speed, and hence loudness, depending on the load. Let's examine it more closely. This particular power supply uses a standard computer power cord that plugs in here. Now I draw your attention to the fact that this cord has a ground plug. Please don't defeat this. This will ground the chassis of the power supply to your household electrical ground and is there for your safety. I note in passing that this ground plug is also wired to the DC ground, which in turn is wired to the chassis on your radio. This is your method for ensuring your radio is grounded from a household electrical point of view. By the way, it may say that it peaks at 30 amps output. But even so, that's only 4 or 5 amps in, so you can plug this into pretty much any household outlet. Now, how do we attach the radio to the power supply? These days, all radios come with power cords. Traditionally, the power cords that came with the radio had bare wires that looked about like this. You then wrap these around the binding posts. Let's pause to note a couple things. First of all, those of you who are used to American house wiring know that the white is the neutral and the black is hot. Well, at 12 volts, the convention is that the black is neutral or ground and the red is hot. Beware here if you have to do a paradigm shift in your mind and don't get them mixed up. The wires hook color to color, red to red and black to black. Be sure these binding posts stay tight. Note that you do not want any of the little strands to short across between the black and the red. Now, here's a problem with this method of wiring. The red 13.8 volt lead is exposed where this ring is and where the wire is. If anything metal drops down here, it could short it out. While the power supply is internally fused, it's better to prevent accidental shorts. I usually wrap the positive lead well with electrical tape. 
Looking at the front of this power supply, we see the more current method for connecting to the radio. These are so-called Anderson power pole connectors. The radio's power cord simply plugs in here. The genius in this arrangement is that the power pole connectors are genderless, so any two will mate together just fine. But note, it's possible to yank the power pole cord right out of the socket. So set it up in a place where this won't happen. For mobile rigs, often you'll find an inline fuse in each lead. Don't defeat these. Go ahead and leave them in. Yes, I know that the manufacturers put these near the end of the line, which makes for a long power cord, but still let's keep every margin of safety we can. Okay, let's move down the radio's power cord. We want to route this where there won't be any chafing or rubbing. Just like regular power cords, don't route these where they can be stepped on or tripped over. Out of sight is best. I point out that you should leave a little slack so you can pull your radio out away from the wall in case you need to get at the back. Now, let's look at the back of the radio. For HF rigs intended to be operated in a home environment, you'll usually find the fuse on the rig's back panel. Up until very recently, most radios used Molex connectors with a proprietary pinout, but now some of the newer ones are using the Anderson power pole connectors. Again, beware, the Anderson connectors can pull out, whereas usually the Molex connectors are more secure. Note here on the back of my Jupiter that there's a fuse. In this case, it's an automotive type of fuse. You will do well to keep a couple of these on hand just in case. In general, modern radios do not often blow fuses. And if yours does more than once in a blue moon, you need to find out why and fix it. I might point out that these are not the only type of Anderson power pole connectors. These are good for 30 amps and are pretty standard in ham radio. If you are assembling these yourself, which you can do with a special crimp tool, be sure to follow the ham radio conventions. Note that the power supply should be turned on first, then the radio. This is because the power supply might output a transient voltage on startup, and it's best to keep the radio off while this is happening. Your radio has its own on and off button. Also, power off the radio before switching off the power supply. Now, let's look at the absolute minimum connections needed for your transceiver. I'm going to presume that you'll start with FM voice or with HF single sideband voice, so you'll need a microphone. Nearly all radios these days come with a hand microphone and a built-in speaker. The hand microphone might not look like much, but it will work well with your radio. Sometimes the microphones are pretty plain, and other times they sport quite a few buttons. The temptation to get a fancier microphone is strong, but the radio will work perfectly well with its included hand mic, so that's a good place to start. I'd hold off getting anything fancier until you get to know your own operating style better. Now, let's move on down the chain to the coax cable. I show here the absolute minimum. A single coax cable between your rig and your antenna can get you started. So, let's talk about coax. You can purchase bulk coax and put the connectors on yourself, but many new hams don't do that. Installing connectors requires soldering, and that requires learning a new skill. Granted, it is a skill set you will want to acquire at some point, but you don't need it right now. Coax cable is available in many lengths with the connectors already in place. Okay, what coax do I recommend? For my station, I'm partial to RG8X. I've used it for years. For a 100 watt HF rig, it's plenty, even for lengthy coax runs. 
At VHF, you'll want to keep the RG8X coax run pretty short. And how long should the coax be? Well, the old saw is that it should be long enough to go between the rig and the antenna. When I first got into ham radio, I thought that was some sort of an in-joke and had to ask a lot of elementary questions of the few hams I knew to learn that it's the literal truth. Assuming a reasonably well-matched antenna, you need a coax cable that's long enough to make the run. Now, let me warn you about something. The coax length that's actually required will be substantially longer than you might think. You want to be sure that you have enough coax so that you can easily pull the rig away from the wall. Plus, route the coax where there won't be any strain on it or where it can be pinched. In my case, I run the cable out through a hole in the floor. This is your key issue in routing the coax. It has to get from indoors to outdoors. You may find yourself getting creative here, especially if you're renting and the landlord doesn't appreciate holes in the wall. MFJ sells a couple items that can help if you have windows that slide up and down. These don't work on other types of windows. For example, my windows open out. We connect the coax to the radio by inserting it so that the little flanges match and then screwing on the outer connector. It should be only finger tight. And when you route the coax, try to avoid sharp bends. There are elbow adapters if you need to push your rig right up against the wall. Outside, coax should be up and away from anyone and anything. It should not be a tripping hazard. It should not act as a guillotine. Don't let moving tree limbs chafe it. Most coax cable is okay in the sunlight. Some is rated for direct burial, meaning it can run underground without being inside a protective sleeve or pipe. Do be aware that there are some crazy animals out there that like to chew on cabling, so check your coax from time to time. And don't hang coax by the connectors. The connector can pull loose. We'll discuss choosing and mounting an antenna next week and how to deal with situations such as limited space and balconies. Thanks for tuning in for this episode of Ask Dave. I look forward to your questions and your comments. Are these episodes helpful? Is there a particular subject you would like to see me address? Please freely share these videos with your friends and comment on this video either on YouTube or at my website at ke0og.net or send a question via ke0og.net slash ask hyphen Dave. And do subscribe. And if you'd like to throw a little something in the tip jar, you can do so using either the YouTube method or on my website. This week's picture is taken right in my backyard. Our little ground-hugging cactus don't bloom every year, but we had quite a bit of spring rain. I found this multiple bloom yesterday. Beautiful, don't you think? Until next week, I'm Dave Kassler, KE0OG, 73.